All right, well, good morning. It's good to see all of you here this morning. Um, if you're a guest, if you're new with us today, we want to say a special welcome to you. We appreciate you coming and uh, spending some time uh, with us this morning. I um, want to remind you about something that we just started uh, last week. Uh, we are collecting supplies for support staff in our local city schools. And we're going to be doing this over the next several weeks until September 2nd. And um, we have a list out on the shelf on the wall to the left in the welcome area. So if you were not here last week, you didn't get one of these lists, I encourage you to go to that wall, pick this up. These are the items that we're going to be collecting over the next several weeks. And uh, so you'll want to pay attention to this list. This hope to see uh, the items growing on these two tables over here on my left and right. And uh, September 2nd, we're going to have one service at 9 o'clock. And then after that, we're going to spend time stuffing bags and getting these ready to go to be delivered to the school system. So anyway, just wanted to make you aware of that. Um, if you need more details, you can go to our website, cornerstonebuzz.org, and, uh, and read that and figure that out there. This morning, we're also going to continue a series that we started last week called Follow Me. And uh, during this series, we're going to spend some time just talking about what does it mean to follow Jesus. We're going to go back and we're going to look at 2,000 years ago what the call looked like of those first disciples and the people who were called to follow Jesus. And then how does that matter to following Jesus today? Is there still some connection and correlation today in terms of how we follow him well? And we're going to find out that there is. Um, but for certain, following Jesus is about being on a particular path in life. And the challenge is to stay focused on that path. And I was thinking about that this week and kind of reflected back on a, uh, something that me and my boys, two other dads and their boys did several years ago. We took a trip out to Colorado and uh, while we were out there we were visiting with a friend, JC, and, and uh, he had all sorts of stuff planned for us to do and, and one of the things that we were going to do and we did on the second day there was to uh, climb up a 14,000 foot mountain. Now most of it we were going to do on a four-wheeler that's real manly, isn't it? You know, I mean, we're not climbing that sucker. We're riding a four-wheeler. So we hauled our four-wheelers out there and everything. And, and so he kind of gave us two casual instructions before we went up the mountain that day. He said, listen, there's going to be one point. The path's going to get kind of narrow. You just want to pay attention. You know, just be careful on that. It'll, it'll all be good. And then there'll be a point right before we get to the top. It gets kind of steep. No big deal. It's going to be great. Let's go, you know. All right, so we loaded up four-wheelers. I had one of my sons on the back with me. My other son's with somebody else. So we get up this mountain and uh, all of a sudden we get to this point and all the four-wheelers stop and JC's at the front and I can see him yelling something back to all of us in the line and uh, essentially what he's saying is all right we're getting to the path and you'll just want to lean hard to the left don't let your back tires you know slide you know lean hard living I'm like what what's he saying you know what, what is that what was that part he just said right there and he's like everybody good let's go and he jumps back on the four-wheeler lines moving and, all right so we're getting up there and we get to the point where I realize what the problem is. We're on a ledge that is barely wide enough for the four-wheelers to fit on, and about an 800 to 900 foot drop down the mountain, just kind of a nice steep angle with loose rock all the way down. Certain death is right there, I'm sure of this. So, you know, I'm looking at that, and, and, and now I understand what he meant by the whole don't let your back tires slide. I'm like, how am I supposed to not let them slide? You know, what is the instruction for that, which is a lot of braking and hitting the gas and stuff. Anyway... So we survived that, about 50 yards of that. We get to the other side, heart in our throat, um, but all is good. We go a little bit further. We get up to the steep point that he's talking about. The four-wheelers will not go any further because the air is so thin that it, it just doesn't work in the engine up that high. So we have to abandon those, and now we're climbing. And it's about a good four to 500-yard hike up to the very top. You know, we're, we're getting close. We're right up to the very top of this thing. Now, we haven't acclimated at all. So if you've ever been at 14,000 feet without spending a couple of days there and acclimating, you just know how hard this is. You know, it's just like breathing with something just pressed against your mouth the whole time. And so, you know, we're, <laughs> we're climbing up this thing, you know, just like, uh, uh, and JC's like, he does this all the time, so it's no big deal for him. Well, we, we, we finally make our way up to the top. We're all heat, you know, we're bending over, we're heathen and stuff like this. But then you look up. And all you can see are mountain peaks because you're the highest point in this whole area of Colorado. Blue skies. It is absolutely amazing. And so we finally caught our breath. We're walking around. We're looking at that. There's a big old stone deal, a bunch of stones they mounted up. There's a big cross put up in the middle of that. I mean, heaven's like right above that cross somewhere. It's like we're right there, you know, that kind of thing. And we're just talking about the goodness of God and creation, and we're praying together. And, 
Come to find out, J.C. spends every Easter sunrise on top of that mountain. How'd you like to do that? And they bring eggs and bacon, which is a bonus. But anyway, so it was, it was this great experience. And, you know, the whole getting up there and seeing this, it was awesome. I had this memory. My boys had this memory. Them and, and their sons have this memory. And, you know, I wonder if it would have been easy to do, would it have been as memorable? Hey, we just got up there and we saw it and then we left and it was great. And it was Mount Peak. I just think it was reflecting on that story about how hard it was during certain moments, you know, that really made it what it was. It made the good even better. And on this path that we're on in this life and following Jesus, man, it is so good. If you've been doing this long enough, you know how good it is, what Jesus provides in our life and what God is calling us to do, and so much goodness along the path. And there are also hard moments, aren't there? Because the promise in Scripture was it will be hard. You know, prepare yourself for that. There will be moments of difficulty where you will be challenged. And you may have to make sacrifices, and you may have to give up something that you think is so precious to you in order to continue to follow, but it's okay because I'll be with you. In it. And so that's kind of what this journey is all about. And, and I go back into Scripture, and, and there's lots of encouragement, and there's also plenty of warning you know, about what to do in those hard moments. And this morning, we're going to look at one of those times when a young man came to Jesus and, and uh, had to make a very difficult choice for him. And uh, we're going to see how that turned out. So if you have your Bibles, we're going to be in Luke chapter 18, verses 18 through 30 this morning. Luke 18, verses 18 through 30. So let me just read through this, and we'll talk about it on the other side. A certain ruler came to Jesus and asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good? Jesus answered. No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not murder. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony. Honor your father and mother. All these I have kept since I was a boy, he said. And when Jesus heard this, he said to him, You still lack one thing. Sell everything you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. And when he heard this, he became very sad because he was very wealthy. And Jesus looked at him and said, How hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. Indeed, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. And those who heard this asked, Well, then, who can be saved? And Jesus replied, What is impossible with man is possible with God. And Peter said to him, Well, we have left all we had to follow you. Truly I tell you, Jesus said to them, No one who has left home or wife or brothers or sisters or parents or children for the sake of the kingdom of God will fail to receive many times as much in this age and in the age to come eternal life. So here's the scene. We know that this is a, a, a young man in other parts of the Gospels. It calls this guy a rich young ruler, a young entrepreneur of the day, think about it like that, who's also very religious and could possibly have even been a religious leader in that day, comes to Jesus and says, look, I feel like I've done everything, but it seems like there's something missing. What do I need to do? And Jesus, you know, being very perceptive and seeing into people's hearts, looks in there and he says, well, I, you know, here's all you got to do. <laughs> and just give up everything and follow me. You know, believe in the goodness of God, you know, who is good, God alone. Believe in the goodness of God and follow me. Just trust it. And in that moment, that rich young ruler looked at Jesus and what he was calling him to and looked at his stuff and his wealth and his life and said, you know what, I'm just not willing to give this up to follow you. So I choose this over you. And that was a, a very difficult moment for sure in that man's life. It seems very sad that he would walk away from what Jesus was offering him, a completely new life for eternity. And I think that generally speaking, the message here is just that, you know, true disciples are those who are truly consistent about giving up control over their life to God. Who are willing to say, you know what, I don't know what it means, God, for you to have control over my finances and my wealth and my relationships and my family and my future, my career, all that. I don't know what that looks like, but I choose to give you control over that. You tell me how you want this done. That's the path that we've been called to follow. And for us, it's this issue of not looking at what we give up, but looking at what we gain. It's about looking at the goodness of God and trusting him and believing him to say, you know what, I trust you because you are a good God. And you have proven throughout my life and throughout history to be good, 
to your, cho- your children, your sons and daughters, those who follow you. And I guess we could look at this story, as many people do, and they say, this is a, a story about money. This is, a, this is like a money lesson, you know, and that kind of thing. And you might think that, but actually, I think what it is, is it is a lesson about values. Because it wasn't so much the issue of the money that Jesus was peering and seeing in this guy's heart. It was his value system. He valued the things of this world over valuing God. And, you know, the thing that we don't want to get stuck doing as we go throughout our life, even as Christians, is valuing our career so much, valuing our possessions so much, valuing really anything on this earth so much that we forget to value God first. And there are many people who get to this, to this particular age in life between about 30 and 50. You know what we call that age? Midlife. And it's really sad that I'm not even in that age anymore. <laughs> but whatever. But we call it midlife. And you know what happens at midlife? What happens? What do we call it? A crisis. And what do we do? We buy stuff. A car we don't need. A boat we don't need. A lake house we might need, but I don't know. We, we just buy things that we, for, we're, we're trying to make up. We're trying to help ourselves think, I have arrived, that I have achieved something. And so I buy something ridiculous to kind of prove to the world and to me that I've done it. It's a crisis. But why is it a crisis? A lot of psychologists will tell you because they see people in their office often who live in this place that it's a crisis because what they realize is in the climbing the ladder of their career, the ladder has been against the wrong wall the whole time. They have now lived long enough and had enough of a career to go realize this promise that this life was supposed to give to me has not played out the way it should. I have not achieved what I should be. I have not gotten to the level I should be. I have spent years climbing this ladder that is against the wrong wall. And you know, for us, what we have to realize is what's the right wall? We don't want to waste time climbing some ladder that has no end, no good end. We want to be sure that we are against that right wall of God. That whatever we're doing and however we're pursuing, that we're pursuing Him first with our career, with our money, with our wealth, with everything that we have. And then we can be sure that He's going to make that line up in the way that it should be. He's going to take care of us along that journey. That, you know, really true disciples follow God obediently. We are on the path of obedience. Because when we're obedient to him, we're listening to his instructions, and especially for those hard times when they come, he's like, just follow, just listen to my instructions. I'll tell you the right thing to do. And as we do that, you know, he secures our life here and in eternity. So quickly, what does that obedience look like today? Just a few things here as I think about that. First of all, obedience is a choice. God will not overwhelm us and force us to do the right thing. You know, he will only say, here are the options. You need to make the right choice. We are free to choose. The rich young ruler who came to Jesus was given a choice. Here it is, you know. Sell all your possessions, sell your wealth, follow me. And as I said last week, will Jesus come and tell us every time we follow him, give up all your wealth and your goods and come follow me? I don't know. Maybe he will, maybe he won't. But if he did, would you? Because this rich young ruler was not willing. That's another thing we talked about last week. He wasn't willing. He, he looked at what he had, and he's like, well, how can I live without this? <laughs> That's what we say. I can't live without this, Jesus. And he's like, well, if you trust me, I promise you will live. You just won't live like you're living right now. It'll be better. <laughs> but you've got to choose me. And you know, it's a choice that we make all the time. This guy, and he probably was steeped in religion. He was Jewish. He knew the commandments. Jesus shared the core of the commandments and said, have you done all these? And he was like, yeah, I've been doing it since I was a kid. And he's like, well, good, then this next one shouldn't be too hard for you. Because the guy was like, I just want the one thing that I need to do. You know, like, I just need the one commandment, Jesus, to do to make sure that I get into eternal life. What is that one? Give me the secret one, the one that that I need to do. What is that one? He says, oh, okay, this is simple. You want some big, wild challenge? Here's what you're going to do. Sell everything and follow me. That's your big commandment to do. And he said, well, wait a minute. Was that that in Scripture? Was that one of the, wait, what? Sell everything? Where's that? Jesus said, exactly. You just, you got to trust me, rich young ruler. There's a, a scripture in Joshua in the Old Testament, a point at which the Israelites are not choosing God. They're following other gods. 
Joshua is their leader at this point. He's very frustrated with them. And he stands up in front of them, and, and I just love this, this moment. And he tells them, listen, if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for you this day whom you will serve, whether the gods of your ancestors served beyond the Euphrates or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you were living. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. And then the people answered, far be it from us to forsake the Lord and to serve other gods. In other words, he was like, listen, today, make the choice. I'm tired of this. You're trying to follow other gods. You're trying to serve this over here and all this kind of stuff. But I'm telling you, as your leader, this day I choose to serve the Lord, and so will my household. That's what we're doing. We're going this way if you want to follow us. It's kind of a brave heart moment. You know, it's like a William Wallace, Mel Gibson, like, <sighs> and then fortunately everybody went, you're right. You're our leader. We choose to follow the Lord. Far be it from us to give in to those other gods that have no power in our life. Obedience is a choice. Another thing is that obedience can be difficult. <laughs> Scripture has also been very clear about this. Obedience can be difficult. There will be moments where you will sit there looking at that narrow path, and you'll look at the edge and go, whew, this looks like it's going to be tough. And you're going to say, well, I could just go back. I could just not do this. I could just bail. Or I can trust and go forward and listen to God obediently and just keep moving. What can I do? What am I doing here? And, you know, Jesus told that guy, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of the needle <laughs> than for a rich man to get to heaven. It's like, oh, gosh, if I have money, am I in trouble? Well, here's the thing. First of all, some people say that that's related to a gate in Jerusalem, and I've seen this gate. It's a big metal gate. They open it during the day to let cattle and people and stuff through at night. They close it, and there's a little door in the big door, and they open the little door so only people can get in. And you have to kind of squat down to go through this and everything. And people say the eye of the needle is related to that. There's no way a camel gets through the little door, and the eye of the needle is what they call the door. But I don't think that, when I look at that thing, I'm like, that thing was not made 2,000 years ago. There ain't no chance of that. So I kind of wonder about that. Lots of other people do too. What I think Jesus was saying was, literally, there's no chance a camel goes to the eye of a little sewing needle. And just like that's impossible, there's no way that anybody is going to do something to inherit the kingdom of God, just like that rich young ruler. He wanted to have his wealth and have eternity at the same time. And Jesus was telling him, you can't pack all that stuff up and get through into eternity that way. That's not how this works. What I'm asking you is to give this up to choose something better. It is impossible for us to, and Jesus said, look, what is impossible with man is possible with God. You see, the thing is, we only do this with God. We can't do it without him. We have to have him in our life to make this work and to find eternal life. So he's like, look, it, it's just hard for people with a lot of wealth if all they do is look at their wealth. That's what he's saying. If you look at it so much that now it's just so important you can't live without it, that's the problem. You're doing it on your own. But if you're willing to say, I'm willing to give that up because I trust the Lord, hey, with God, all things are possible. John 16, Jesus said, in this world you will have trouble. Take heart. I have already overcome the world. You will face hard times. Don't worry about it. I've already overcome that world. Don't let that world get a hold of you. I've already defeated that at the cross. We've got this. And then just this thing right here. Obedience is wise. I mean, really, when it comes right down to it, obedience is just wise. If you really want to be wise in this life, you will choose God in every possible place that you can because what he is offering you is the right life here and the right life in eternity. So obedience is just wise. The disciples said, look, Jesus, we have left all to follow you. And Jesus was like, good choice. <laughs> good choice. That was the wise choice. And in doing so, you're going to experience a life that you've never experienced before. It's, there's going to be a good return on that investment. Um, there's uh, someone in our church, and we're going to share his story right here. Um, Tyler McGill. Tyler is uh, some, he's a believer who understands what we're talking about today in terms of just what it means to to follow Christ. He is somebody who has been at the top of his game in his uh, career of athletic swimming and uh, professional swimming. He's won a gold medal at the Olympics. He knows what that's all about. Um, coached at Auburn University, um, has had to make hard choices, and um, but uh, his faith has certainly shown through that. So we have his story this morning. So let's go ahead and share that, and we'll come back on the other side.
So I think for me, thinking about when I became a believer in Christ is like the more I've thought about it, it's more about like when did I finally listen to all the different ways that Christ was trying to like come into my life. And then even when I came to school, I had lots of really good people around me, whether it was teammates on the, on the swim team um, or just friends and acquaintances that I came across with. A lot of those people had awesome relationships with Christ, at least from my perspective. But that wasn't my life, so to speak. Um, even once my wife and I got married, like we, Christ was a part of our lives, but there wasn't that relationship, so to speak. And so for me, I think when um, Julianne was pregnant with Amelia, that would have been um, basically fall of 2013. And, and from that point on, I think our, my wife and I are... are our mission for our family has been to fill more of that relationship with Christ and that's definitely again not the case prior to I would say you know expecting Amelia um, and especially not as an athlete before that you know you'll see a lot of athletes who who give their their glory and their accomplishments over to Christ and I, that's amazing and, and I love to hear those stories but what you don't always hear is like the reverse of that, of people who miss something or they don't fully succeed and then they say, well, thank you, Lord, for all that I've still received and the blessings that I have. So in 2012, um, finished the Olympic year and was part of a relay that, that won a gold medal, but I wanted to be better in the individual and I walked away from that meet in 2012 not being satisfied and, and not being able to enjoy all the amazing things that just happened and all the, the travel and the experience and there was something there that was just telling me like you're not satisfied and that carried with me for for two years um, and then when we had Amelia and we started to invest in that relationship with Christ I began to realize that it's because I didn't have that in my life in 2011 and 2012 that I, I couldn't enjoy those things to the fullest because that wasn't there. After 2013, an opportunity opened for me to be become assistant coach with the swim team at Auburn. And so I've, I've been doing that for the last five years. And in March of this year, our head coach announced that um, he was going to resign and he was stepping down from, from being the head coach. The university brought in a new head coach um, and ultimately he decided to bring in an entire new staff and so it kind of put me in a position where I love Auburn I want to continue to serve Auburn but that's not in the cards so over the last really eight to ten weeks um, especially early on in that there was this period where I was still employed by Auburn um, a new staff was coming in. At that stage, there was really two choices for me. It was continue to serve and help and invest into the athletes that were here and invest into the program that was here with the uncertainty of what was to become. Or it was to say, you know what? This isn't what I wanted. This isn't what I envisioned. And so I'm gonna just cut and bail and find something else. I just really felt like there was some of those people here still um, who had finished their careers at Auburn who were a little bit lost and they needed somebody to say, I'm here for you. I think that's the, the, the biggest question. You know, we talk about the young rich ruler like, and are they willing to sacrifice and give up? And sometimes I think that means literally give up and pass over possession. And I think another times that means, um, are you willing to give up your time? Are you willing to say that um, everything that is about me would be willing to leave and go and look for a different opportunity? Or is the Lord calling me and saying, hey, follow me in this direction. I'm still asking you to help these people who are lost and who need you. So I really think one of the biggest challenges I faced through all this is just that idea of when you go through 
situations in life where you're challenged and, and you go through areas of your life where they're not what you want. You're being drawn to live, which is in this area of sadness and disappointment and heartache and anger. The Lord's calling you to be in this place of trust and belief and stillness. There's so much more joy, there's so much more rejoicing and satisfaction that's there that allows you to work through whatever it is that's being put on your plate or whatever is being taken away from you that you, that you want to keep. And so I think that's, that's led into how we want to raise our children, how we want to live our lives, how we want to invest in our community, of being able to say through everything that we go through in life, Praise the Lord. Rejoice in all of, all of His glories and all that He gives us. <clears throat> yeah, I think that if I, as I've gotten to know Tyler over the last several months, the thing that I've understood about him is that he's wise enough to have his values in place. And that um, that was done before this abrupt change in his life and career. And so he was prepared for that mentally and in his heart you know, to follow God, to do a couple of hard things on the way, but God is taking care of him, and, um, and he's choosing to follow. Now, I'm not going to set him up to be some perfect follower, because he's not, I'm not, you're not, so that's not what we're talking about here, but we're just talking about trying to take the next right step on this path that God has us on, and listening very intently, and just being obedient to his calling, and trusting him for the outcome. Amen?